Well, the Lab Lebanese government has ordered an investigation into the blast, as we just heard, and how 2,750 tons of the explosive chemical ammonium nitrate could be stored at this site. Now, we can see just how powerful the blast was by comparing before and after photos of the site. Take a look at this. Here we have a look at the harbor before the blast. We know the fire brigade was finding a blaze in the building that is circled in red. And now you see after the blast. Not only has the building been completely obliterated, so has the ground underneath it, leaving a water-filled crater and complete destruction around that area. Ammonium nitrate is used to make fertilizer and bombs. In 1995, it was used in the Oklahoma City bombing, which at the time was the deadliest act of domestic terrorism in U.S. history. What do we know tonight about the blast in Beirut? Well, to talk about that, I'm joined by chemist and broadcaster Andrea Sella. Mr. Sella, it's good to have you on the program. You've seen the video of the explosions and, and what happened from them. I mean, we're going to show the videos again, and maybe if you could talk us through it and tell us what you see um, when you're looking at the explosions, what can be surmised from these blast clouds. If I can just say one thing, I Please. can't actually see your screen. Okay. But I pretty well know what's going on in the video, so I will attempt to um, describe things. So the first okay. thing is that there is a fire burning somewhere in the uh, in the warehouse itself. And that fire is clearly the thing which which triggered the really massive events that followed. There's then uh, a, a huge orange fireball which which is which is produced. And this is the initial rather slow in in kind of technical terms um, explosion where presumably the ammonium nitrate really began to burn and blow up. But moments later, there is a second type of explosion, what's called the detonation. Mm -hmm. And this is one which really happens kind of at supersonic speed. And this produces this extraordinary shock wave. And one can see that, that, that huge, almost spherical um, sort of bulb of mist which travels outwards from uh, the, the, the center of, of the blast. And that's really a, a sign of this enormous shock wave. And that's the thing that will really have caused enormous amounts of damage. Can you um, surmise, based on, um, based on what we've been able to see, um, what would have triggered all of this? Would it have been just th this fire? Because we understand there were firefighters on the scene um, would it have been fires, firecrackers, for example, fireworks that were on fire that could have then triggered everything else that followed? So, you know, ammonium nitrate has a very sorry long-term industrial history, mm -hmm. um, you know, starting with Opau, um, at the at the in Germany, uh, the first place where ammonium nitrate was manufactured, and then on through the decades, again and again and again, ammonium nitrate has has detonated and has caused you know massive destruction, and almost invariably these things start with a fire of some kind, right? And and that's the thing that triggers things. Now, when you watch the videos, you do hear some sort of crackling and banging, and you see flashes. And so it may be that somewhere in the warehouse or adjacent to it, um, there was a consignment of uh, fireworks or some kinds of munitions. Mm -hmm. The fire department were called um, because, of course, there would have been huge concerns. The real worry is, you know, what happened to those firemen? And this is yeah. very, very reminiscent of what happened in Tianjin in, in, in China in 2015, where again, the fire brigade were called to uh, a fire in a port warehouse. And then, you know, the detonation happened. We know, as you, as you just said, people know that this chemical is dangerous. And yet it was stored right in the middle of Beirut, we learned today, for up to six years. I mean, how should it properly be stored? I mean, you know, that is, that is really disastrous. I mean, you know, the quantity is absolutely enormous. And, you know, we know that it has to be stored pretty carefully, and especially not in the long term, because what it tends to do is it picks up a bit of moisture, it cakes up, it becomes much more solid. And, and at that point, it becomes more dangerous. The idea that you had 3,000 tons of this stuff, mm -hmm. which is really close to residential areas, just doesn't bear thinking about. And it's an indication of an absolutely massive regulatory failure. 
I mean, you know, we have very, very stringent in, in all countries regulations governing how you handle and how you store ammonium nitrate for this very reason. Do you but it, it appears that that in 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 Beirut, they got into a kind of tangle between the legal authorities, the safety authorities, the port authorities that just led to gridlock. And so think- it just kind of sat there. And, and there is a complacency here. Remember, yeah. when nothing happens. We start to assume, oh, it'll be okay. Mr. Sill, before we run out of time, do you think that something like this could happen in another city somewhere on the planet? I mean, this isn't just a Beirut-specific tragedy, is it? Well, you know, it's it's incredibly hard to uh, make predictions, especially about the future. But the history of ammonium nitrate tells us that this thing happens regularly, again and again. And it really underlines the reason why we must never lower our guard when it comes to chemical safety regulations. And industrial accidents happen a lot. They Mm -hmm. happen due to kind of complicated chains. It'll be very, very difficult to ascribe blame to one or another individual. There are clearly responsibilities all the way down the line, and it will happen again, unfortunately. Yeah, and it's unfortunate that the people in Beirut could not profit from the knowledge that you know, that I know, that is so common around the world. What a tragedy. Catastrophic. Absolutely catastrophic. Andreas Heller joining us tonight from Switzerland. Mr. Seller, we appreciate your time and your insights tonight. Thank you. My pleasure.